New numbers paint a positive picture for the White House as they head into the midterm elections. President Trump's approval rating jumped up one point from 44 to 45 percent. But what is perhaps even more striking, he is seeing very big support within his own party. The president has an 88 percent approval rating rate among Republicans of the last four presidents. Only President George W. Bush during the aftermath of 9-11 saw a higher number within his own party at this point in the presidency. Trace Gallagher has more on all these numbers and the uh, interesting insight inside them as we head into November. Hey, Trace. Hey, Martha, the context of this poll is important because it was taken over a four day period beginning July 15th, the day before the president's news conference with Vladimir Putin, where Mr. Trump questioned the conclusion of U.S. intel agencies that Russia meddled in the election. So the majority of this poll was conducted at the height of the criticism, and yet the president's approval rating is up, though it is notable that 51 percent of registered voters do not approve of the relationship between Washington and Moscow. A Democratic pollster who helped conduct the poll says, quoting, welcome to the latest and most daring of Donald Trump's high wire acts in which the president increases his degree of difficulty and manages yet again to stay on his feet. For example, half of those polled approve of the president's handling of the economy and 51 percent disapprove of his handling of border security. The poll also shows partisanship at an all time high with just nine percent of Democrats saying they like Mr. Trump's performance as president. That is the lowest number of the past four presidents when it comes to opposite party support. Meantime, the new Gallup poll shows Americans believe the number one problem facing the country is immigration. 22% say it's the top issue. Not only that, it's up, that is up eight points from June, but 22% marks the highest point in Gallup poll history. The previous high was April 2006 when 19 percent cited immigration as the biggest concern, though pollsters point out that when Democrats cite immigration, they are likely pointing to the president's handling of the issue. Republicans, meantime, are likely talking about the number of immigrants crossing the border illegally. 19 percent of registered voters polled by Gallup say the government is the biggest problem facing the country. And finally, just 4 percent of Americans say the economy in general is the nation's top problem that is very good news for President Trump, especially when you consider that in February of 2009, 86% of Americans listed the economy as problem one. And by the way, ISIS, the concern over ISIS did not even register on the poll. Martha. Fascinating. Trace, thank you very much. Here now, Carl Rove, yeah. former Deputy Chief of Staff to President George W. Bush and a Fox News contributor. Mike Allen is executive editor and co-founder of Axios. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Um, Mike, let me start with you. I haven't seen you in a while. It's good to have you on the show. Um, thanks, thanks for Martha. being here tonight. So when you take a look at the overall approval number, uh, are you surprised, given Helsinki and all the rest, that the, the president uh, has ticked up a point during that period? No, not at all, Martha. 90% among Republicans, and I can go you bit one better than those numbers that Trace had up. Depending on what poll you look at, 70 to 80% of Republicans approve of the president specifically mm -hmm. on his handling of Putin. How do you explain it? It doesn't matter what he does. They trust him and they like what he's doing. But there's an important piece of the puzzle that worries people in the White House that's not reflected in those polls. And that is the excitement on the other side, the enthusiasm among Democrats. So, Martha, I have a spoiler for you, a little sneak peek. Tomorrow morning when you open up Axios.com or my newsletter, Axios AM, the headline is going to be good news for House Democrats. There's new sign of House seats moving toward Democrats, the Cook political report saying they still see a blue wave driven by suburban professionals. Hmm. Add to that, if you look at presidential and party approval, other signs that are similar to what we've seen in past wave elections. I, you know, I mean, I think it's fascinating. The president got so beaten up uh, over the Helsinki, Helsinki trip and uh, the, some of the course of the rest of that trip, Carl, and yet the number is rising. And I wonder sometimes if, you know, all of the incoming that he gets doesn't bolster his support in some ways among his party. Oh, I think that's right. We're at a tribal phase in American yeah. politics. So if if he gets attacked, the members of the tribe uh, r rally around him, and the members of the opposition, uh, you know, step up in, in their fervor. And and that's why it, there's one thing in here that's important. 
uh, overall approval is 45, Republicans 88, Independence was 40. That's down seven from previous from the from last month. And you can't win an election alone, Democrat or Republican, without doing well among independents. And so while it's good that he's got all that support among Republicans, that means in deep red states and deep red districts that he's probably his his allies in the Congress are in pretty good shape. But in those suburban districts that are going to determine the control of the House. Uh, you got to worry about that if you're sitting in the West Wing of the White House about the number declining among independents. Uh, and absolutely. And, you know, I mean, when you look at those independents, you have to wonder what's going to eventually pull them one way or the other because the economy is in very good shape. And that's going to be a major selling point for Republicans, Mike. They're going to look at, you know, suburban voters in places like Philadelphia and say, you know, look, but is your life any better? And probably they're going to say, yeah, actually it is. And are they going to vote for Democrats in that environment? I don't know. Well, uh, Martha, you're exactly right. And that's why I can tell you Democrats at the highest level, as optimistic as they are about the midterms, they're pessimistic about 2020. And it's for the reasons you're pointing to. The president has peace and prosperity. Carl can well tell you that's what any incumbent president dreams of. But in addition to the economy, there's one other thing the Republicans have to hang their hat on. And even though there is a lot of excitement on the other side, NBC Wall Street Journal polling shows that there's a lack of excitement among millennials and Hispanics, two very important core voter groups for Democrats if they're going to take back the House and have a Speaker Pelosi restoration. You know, and I also wonder about polls. I mean, we all have to wonder about polls after 2016 and whether or not people answer these questions, whether or not, you know, the, the broad spectrum of Trump voters pick up the phone or answer the phone or answer the Internet uh, questionnaire. Carl, what do you think? Well, look, the, the national polls got it pretty close. Uh, the individual state polls varied, and that's to be expected. I think the pollsters are working hard on making certain that their samples are representative of the country. And uh, so I, I, right now, I like always, uh, I, I'm always cautious about taking one poll and looking at it. Uh, you want to look at an average of polls that are asking similar questions. And, and you'll see that, for example, in this Wall Street Journal uh, uh, NBC poll, and the generic ballot is plus six yep. in that poll, and among in the real clear politics average, it's 7.4. Yep. And if you see it, the, the, the Republicans are suffering among independents. The independents are, have moved between uh, the last NBC Wall Street Journal poll to this one uh, by a pretty significant margin. There were seven points for the Democrats. They're now 12. And we're seeing this in all the overall polls as well. Well, and, a lot can and, happen between now and November. I got to leave it there, guys. Mike, yeah, thank you very much. Absolutely. Carl, great to see you guys. Thanks, thank Martha. you. All righty. So, oh, what a horrible story this is. The tragic duck boat accident in Missouri. Could it have been avoided? And what made that boat sink so fast, leaving 17 people dead? We're going to talk to a man who says that it should have been predicted next. They were throwing out life jackets to people. And I said, Jesus, please keep, keep me. Just keep me so I can get to my children. Keep me, Lord. I couldn't see anybody. I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't hear screams. I just, it felt like I was out there on my own. And I was yelling and I was screaming. And finally I said, Lord, just let me die. Let me die. I said, I can't, I can't keep drowning. I just can't keep drowning because that's how I felt. She was one of the survivors of that deadly duck boat accident. She lost her children and her husband. She was describing the horror as it went down in Missouri's Table Rock Lake leaving 17 people dead. Today, they brought the boat back up to the surface as new questions are being raised about how this could happen. Since 1999, duck boats have been linked to nearly 40 deaths and have a troubled safety record, both on land and in the water. Joining me now is Stephen Paul, an inspector who warned the company behind Thursday's deadly accident of a serious design flaw in these boats last year. Stephen, thank you for being here tonight. Um, if only uh, they had listened um, to what you explained to them. To tell everybody what you think is the design flaw in these boats and does it exist in all of them? Uh, well, good evening and, and thanks for having me on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's a, a handful of different issues that, that we find on these boats. And uh, the first issue that I find uh, inspecting the boat under, boat under DOT standards is that the exhaust is forward of the passenger compartment on the front of the ship, um, likely leading to uh, water getting into the engine and then uh, stalling out the engine, of course, as well as uh, um, 
removing the boat's capability of purging its own water. So in terms of the, the other thing that you pointed out is, is the canopy. Now these are sort of retrofitted. Um, some of them are from 1944. Some of them are, are the, the shell of them is from 1944 and they're the kind of boats that were used on the beaches at Normandy, right? But then they, they add to them and they alter them and they change them. Well, that is correct. I mean, uh, pretty much the, the, only, the only parts that are, that are still from the World War II era uh, is, is some of the sides and, and realistic are probably the dashboard. Uh, the boats have actually been been cut and stretched similar to a limousine mm. uh, and the interior is also uh, widened a little bit for for passenger space um, and the engines have also been changed out so there's really not a whole lot left of the world war ii ducks um, and obviously it has the canopy and and also curtains on the sides which you think it just basically acted as a trap in this case it, 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 I do believe so. I think it was uh, pretty much what I call a people catcher. Mm. Um, you know, being being shaped at the top, kind of like a dome. If that thing went underwater, uh, people are going to float to the top of it. And uh, with the side curtains down, it's going to be extremely difficult to get out of that ship. Stephen Paul, uh, we hope this ha doesn't happen to anyone else. And we thank you for being here. We hope that people are listening to um, what you have to say about the way they're built. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. Thank you. So, from the Trump campaign to the president's chief spokesman, Sean Spicer is now telling all, and he is my guest, coming up next.